in the previous lecture, I provided um, five different justifications for why baseline normalizations are useful in, uh, in cognitive electrophysiology um, time frequency data analysis. In this lecture, I'm going to uh, introduce you to two of the methods um, that, that are most commonly used for um, decibel normalization, uh, for uh, baseline normalization. Um, so again, the idea or the, the goal is to get from a raw time frequency power plot that looks like this to a plot that looks more like this, so a baseline normalized plot, where we can see uh, very clearly not only the increases relative to the baseline, but also the decreases relative to the baseline. These decreases in particular are very difficult to visualize in this raw um, uh, time frequency power plot. Although obviously you can kind of m make it out a little bit here, but uh, it's very difficult to see. Also here you can directly compare the effects across frequencies, whereas that's exceedingly difficult and, and basically not valid to do with uh, raw power. Um, and this was due to something called the 1 over F uh, um, power loss scaling. It's this um, empirical observation that um, frequency band specific activity, the, or the power of frequency specific activity, generally decreases with increasing frequency. And so this causes several um, interpretive and, uh, and statistical problems, and we want to um, address this somehow. So um, it's really not possible to use a linear baseline uh, correction, like something like just subtracting the pre-stimulus level of um, power. Um, instead, we need some kind of a nonlinear correction that takes this power law into account. And so the, the, the main solution um, is not using a subtraction, but using a division. Um, and one of the main methods for this division comes from uh, Alexander Graham Bell, who, uh, among other things, invented the telephone. So this looks like, uh, you know, if you would see someone like this now, you know, you would think he's just some hipster from Brooklyn or something like that. But uh, believe it or not, this picture was taken over 100 years ago. Before I get into the details, there's two quotes from Alexander Bell that I, I like to, to show um, because I find them inspiring and also interesting. One quote is, um, he says, there are no unsuccessful experiments. Every experiment contains a lesson. If we don't get the results anticipated and stop right there, it is the man, <laughs> okay. Well, you know, this is a long time ago, so we could say the person uh, that is unsuccessful, not the experiment. I like that quote a lot because, uh, you know, there is some pressure in, in science and in particular in publishing on what we would consider to be successful experiments, which means um, P less than 0.05 or whatever the statistical threshold is. Um, but I think, you know, arguably a successful experiment means that we've learned something, uh, not necessarily that we've gotten statistically significant results. So that's a nice quote. Here's another nice quote that he made in 1906. <clears throat> the day will come when the uh, person at the telephone will be able to see the distant person to whom he or she is speaking. Uh, this quote I also like because basically uh, Alexander Bell um, predicted the invention of Skype a uh, hundred years or over, uh, yeah about a hundred years before it uh, came into existence. So anyway, getting back, so we have something called a decibel. Um, it is ten uh, bells, and um, it is a ratio. Ratios are useful because they are scale free. Therefore, they overcome the uh, power law scaling. The formula to compute a decibel is very simple. You basically just take your activity and then divide by the baseline. Um, and then to convert the this division to decibel, we um, take the uh, log 10 of, of, of this ratio and then we multiply it by 10. I don't know why we multiply it by 10. We could also just um, have this be in uh, bells, but uh, I don't know, this is convention to do it 10 log 10 of activity over baseline. Really, the important thing here is the division of the activity by the baseline. Um, of course, what you call the baseline and how you define this baseline is really a non-trivial um, issue, and this will be the topic for uh, another, I think, the next lecture. But the important thing is that there is uh, your activity is, is divided by the activity 
in the baseline period, and this is of course done separately for each frequency. Um, this is just to note, you know, this is just the way you can rewrite logs as the division within the log or the subtraction of the two logs, whichever you prefer, it doesn't matter. Um, this is very nice. That converts this plot and this plot, which show the same data, uh, just with different um, uh, uh, color scaling, to something like this. And now this is nice, this decibel transform plot. This is nice because you can now directly compare the increase at 5 hertz to the increase at 13 hertz. And in this plot, it is valid to say that there is more activity at 13 hertz than at 5 hertz. I mean, I don't remember where this came from. It looks like just noise, but you know, imagine these were, you know, real data. Uh, uh, it is valid to say that uh, the increase in 13 hertz is greater than the increase at 5 hertz. Whereas in, in this plot, it is really not valid. You are going to find that the power is higher at 5 hertz compared to 13 hertz just because of this power law scaling. Here you, you can also see um, highlighted now in these uh, decibel transformed uh, results uh, these these edge artifacts at the at the beginning and at the end, and so of course you never want to, uh, or I should say you always want to cut your um, data epochs to be large enough to be wide enough to um, to have the edge artifacts be safely out of the way from any um, activity periods any time periods that you'll be interested in. Okay, and again, these two uh, lines come from the same data. This might be the same as the previous uh, uh, slide, I don't remember. But here's with the absolute power, and again, you know, the 1 over F shape is so strong, you really can't interpret any of these results. But now you look at the relative power, so relative to the baseline, and now you can see the power spectrum that looks actually very typical for EEG. You see some delta, theta, alpha, beta, low gamma, you know, very uh, um, interpretable, meaningful results that we can see in the decibel normalized um, uh, plot that we don't see in the, the raw power plot. Um, another thing to mention, this is related to one of the points I said at the end of the previous lecture, um, decibel scaling is also useful because it, it allows to validly um, compare the findings across different subjects. Um, and this is because different individuals and not only different um, people, but also different electrodes, different equipment, different um, uh, montages, you know, all sorts of, uh, of non-brain related differences are going to um, change the, uh, the, the levels of absolute uh, power and microvolt uh, values. Um, but but the decibel normalization will actually obliterate all of these uninteresting differences. And so you can really validly compare a result of one decibel across different, uh, different experiments and different uh, patient groups, for example, and different, uh, different um, types of equipment. Okay, so, that, so I just mentioned uh, decibel. There's also percent change, which is very similar. The formula for percent change is to subtract the activity minus the baseline, divide by the baseline period, um, and then multiply by 100. You can see the important thing here is, again, that we are dividing by the baseline activity. In that sense, computing percent change is very similar to computing the decibel. You can see I've highlighted here in both of these um, formulations, the important part is that we divide the, the amount of activity during the um, the task period um, uh, by the level of activity in the same frequency band during the baseline period. That's really the most important um, component of these normalization procedures. All this other stuff, percent change and decibel, these do actually differ a bit, uh, as I'll show, but uh, the, really the important thing is dividing the activity by the baseline. Um, what I wanted to show in this plot, and you'll see this as well in, in MATLAB in a minute, is that percent change and decibel change are actually not identical transforms. They're not exactly the same thing. And that's related to the fact that decibel is a uh, logarithmic scale. Um, and so the values become more extreme, uh, or I should say more different from, uh, or divergent from these uh, more linear values at very small values and very high values. Um, but empirically, you will see most of the time 
with uh, EEG, MEG, and LFP recordings that most of the data tend to be, you know, somewhere between uh, minus four and four or, or three and, and two, you know, these kinds of ranges. And here there's, you know, a roughly equivalent um, uh, relationship between uh, percent change and decibel. Um, I don't think there's any specific reason to prefer decibel or percent change uh in my opinion uh, or it, it, in my sort of purview i think decibel is more frequently done in the literature uh, but anyway the important point is that you have some kind of normalization um so now let's look at this in matlab real quick here just to show you the relationship between um the so-called activity this is there's no real data here this is all simulate data uh relationship between activity and its decibel uh, normalization um, and here is uh, reproducing that same plot um, so in the next several lectures I will show you more specifically about the mechanics about um, how to apply this to real data and issues of, uh, of um, picking the baseline and things like that but uh, I just wanted to use this video to quickly introduce you to decibel and percent change